are listening to the Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine. And now here's your host, Rich Outfield and Big Anklevich. Hi everybody, this is Big Anklevich. Welcome to another episode of the Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine. Here on my left side is... Rish Outfield. Good job, Rish. Thanks a lot for that contribution. You're really getting the hang of this podcasting thing. I'm, I'm pretty impressed. You have three new messages. <laughs> wait a minute. Oh, wait, OT, did you sneak in here in Rish Outfield's place? To delete these messages, press 7. Otherwise, they shall be saved in your cubbyhole for 30 days cubby hole sorry i couldn't sell it yeah yeah you almost did though it was really close mm-hmm. all right folks we have a new story for you today i will tell you the the story behind the story after the story will we but can you tell us what the story is rich outfield yeah the story is the dragon muse by david b co mm, okay and uh Big, as you as you know, and as the listeners already know, David B. Coe is the author of more than 15 fantasy novels, including The Lawn Tobin Chronicles, The Winds of the Four Lands, and Blood of the Southlands, and The Thief Taker Chronicles. That sounds like some good stuff. All right. Uh, anything we should tell the folks before we head off into it? Turn it off now. <laughs> Seriously, I'm, I'm not messing around. This is your one warning. They only allow us one. <laughs> the robots are standing over us with brain melters. This is our only chance to warn you. After that, it's melt brain. All right, folks. I hope you enjoy the story, and uh, we'll see you on the other side. Works for me. Oh, no. They already melted his brain. It's too late. The Dragon Muse by David B. Coe. The deadline made him do it. Not the first deadline, which had come and gone so long ago that the wall calendar with August 31 circled and starred had been replaced by a new one, which also had been replaced. Nor the second one, which fell in the middle of his divorce trial. His agent had been too circumspect to bother him about that one, although every phone call that began with expressions of sympathy and solicitous questions about his well-being ended with subtle reminders like, So, how's the book coming? Or, Got anything for me yet? No. It was the looming third deadline that kept Tom Mathers up at night. The final deadline. That's what his agent had told him the previous week. Last one, Tommy. Phil had said, practically shouting into the phone over the drone of cars and honking horns. Woodship says they're serious this time. They'll cancel the contract. (laughs) They will not, Tom said, his amused chuckle coming out more like a cough. Woodship has been putting out Speed Falco P.I. books for ten years. It's a franchise. They won't cancel the series now. I think they will. You should have heard Pamela today. She's none too happy, my friend. Phil paused. You're making progress, right? You're nearly done? Oh, uh, oh yeah. Sure I am. I've got... It's coming along. Good, Phil said, the background noise nearly drowning his voice. Listen, Tommy, I've got to go. Just get it done, all right? On time. Yeah, all right. But the line had already gone dead. Eight days had passed since their conversation, and he was still staring at the same blank page on his computer screen. Chapter 3. That was all it said. He had started this chapter countless times, only to delete everything and start over. The first two chapters were set. Well, they were good enough. But now what? He had ten days left. He looked at the clock. One oh seven. Nine and a half days. His stomach did a little flip. A walk. That would clear his mind, get the juices flowing. He'd walk, maybe get a cappuccino, and then come straight back here and work clear through to dinner. Right. It was raining when he left the apartment. 
not a downpour, but hard enough to make a walk unpleasant, especially with a cold wind blowing off the harbor. Typical March weather. He turned up the collar on his coat, lowered his head, and started to walk, fully intending to go to the Mocha Man. He hadn't planned to go anywhere near word magic. He didn't like the place, never had, and it wasn't even on the way to the coffee shop. But somehow that was where he wound up, staring through the rain-streaked window at displays of fancy pens made with exotic woods, writing journals, and portfolios bound in pressed leather, desk lamps made of antique stained glass. For years he'd wondered how a store that specialized in luxury items for writers could manage to stay open for so long. Word Magic's entire business plan was an oxymoron. Were there that many writers in this city, and did all of them crave bird's-eye maple desk organizers and letter openers with inlaid Coca-Bolo handles? Tom did well with his books, better than most writers, but even he didn't waste his money on agate fountain pens and organic inks. Hell, he wrote everything on his computer. He couldn't remember the last time he'd used a pen that he hadn't stolen from a hotel. Whenever he came to this neighborhood, he expected to see that Word Magic was having its big going-out-of-business sale. That they continued to survive made no sense to him. That is, until he heard about the loft. Meg, his ex-wife, was the first to mention it to him. And seeing his blank expression, she had laughed. "'No wonder you have such contempt for the place,' she'd said. "'You've never even been inside, have you?' When he admitted that he hadn't, she laughed at him again. She was always laughing at him, and said, Next time, go inside. You might actually learn something. He'd gone the next day, and upon stepping into the loft, had nearly been overcome by the incense and heated oils. Nutmeg and anise, rose hips and almond, sage and ginger, all mixed together in a near-toxic cloud of sickly sweet smoke. His eyes watering, Tom had resisted the urge to leave, and instead began to browse the dusty shelves. There were crystal spears of green tourmaline, rough fragments of aventurine, and egg-shaped pieces of turquoise and peridot. One shelf was filled with what appeared to be chicken's feet, and another held jars containing dead spiders, moths, butterflies, and scarab beetles. There were shelves upon shelves of incenses and oils, as well as chimes and what looked like small xylophones. A crowd had gathered near the back of the store, making it impossible for Tom to look at the items displayed there, but by that time he'd seen enough. He left the loft empty-handed, vowing never to set foot in word magic again. He didn't need herbs or oils or crystals to make him successful. He didn't need charmed poultry parts or dead bugs to be inspired. He was an author. His creativity flowed from within. His success had been earned over the years. He would continue to rely on hard work, perseverance, and, yes, he would admit it, a bit of luck, as he always had. But that year, a friend gave him a talisman from the loft as a sort of gag gift for his birthday. It was a piece of green tiger's eye that had been carved into the shape of a hand holding a pen. Tom would have guessed that it cost hundreds of dollars. The carving was quite intricate, and he'd only seen green tiger's eye once or twice before. But his friend assured him that it hadn't cost much, and that the saleswoman had insisted it would bring Tom great good fortune. <laughs> that was what she said. The friend told him, chuckling and shaking his head, Great good fortune. It was worth the price just for that. Perhaps a week after he received the gift, the first Speed Falco P.I. book was optioned by a Hollywood studio. A coincidence, no doubt. But several weeks later, Tom knocked the talisman off his desk and onto the wood floor of his office. A piece of stone broke off the end of the thumb. Thinking little of it, Tom threw the fragment away and put the carving back where it had been. The next day, Phil called to tell him that the studio had cancelled the deal. As soon as he hung up the phone, Tom rummaged through the garbage, retrieved the fragment of stone, and glued it back in place. But the studio heads didn't change their minds again. Standing in that cold rain, staring into the word magic display window, Tom wondered what his life might have been like if he hadn't broken the talisman. 
He was sure that he'd have more money, and he guessed that he would probably still have Meg, too. And if they'd made the movie, and it had done well, the suits at Wood Ship Publishing certainly wouldn't have been giving him a hard time about deadlines and threatening to pull the plug on the speed books. He glanced up and down the street before opening the door to Word Magic and stepping inside. Small brass bells chimed as he pulled the door closed behind him. The store clerk sitting at the counter looked up from her book and smiled at him. Good afternoon. He muttered good afternoon in return. You're Tom Mathers, aren't you? Great. The one time someone recognized him. He fixed a smile on his lips and faced her. She was younger than he, maybe early thirties, plain-looking with dark-rimmed glasses and dirty blonde hair that she wore tied up in a loose bun. Yes, I, I am, he said. He'd expected a request for an autograph, or a compliment on his most recent novel, Lightspeed, but she merely nodded and turned back to her reading. Let me know if you need any help, she said absently. Actually, <clears throat> he cleared his throat. Actually, I, I wanted to see something in the loft. She nodded again, her eyes fixed on the book, which appeared to be some sort of vampire novel. Kathy's up there. She'll help you. He walked to the back of the store and climbed the narrow wooden stairway to the second floor. The incense wasn't as overpowering this time. It smelled of nutmeg and really wasn't so bad. Another woman, younger than the first, sat in the corner near the stairway. She had black hair and wore heavy makeup around her periwinkle blue eyes. She seemed to be reading a book by the same author as the girl downstairs. Hey, she said, you're Tom Mathers. He had to laugh. Yes, I am. Are you a fan? She wrinkled her nose. Not really, no. Nothing personal. I'm just not into the whole shoot 'em up thing, you know? But we all know the local authors. Kind of like our job, if you know what I mean. He didn't. But clearly she thought he should have, so he just nodded and began to wander down the nearest aisle. Can I help you find something? Tom faltered, looking back at her. Um... Not really sure what you're looking for, right? Not really. Is this for you or a friend? She asked, putting her book down on the counter and walking toward him. She was taller than she'd appeared while seated. She wore a black t-shirt that didn't quite cover her midriff, and tight jeans that accentuated her hips and high waist. Ah. Uh, it's all right. It's for you, isn't it? He nodded again. You're having trouble writing? Tom swallowed. I, I have this deadline. It's, it's not the first, and I can't seem to, you know. He looked away, his cheeks burning. It's all right, she said. It happens to lots of writers. How soon is the book due? Less than two weeks. She cringed, sucking air through perfect white teeth. That soon. How far along are you? He shook his head. It felt good, in a way, to unburden himself finally, after lying for so long to Pamela and Phil. Not far, eh? Two chapters, he said. A smile crept over her face. You need a muse. Tom blinked. You sell muses? Oh, yeah, she said with a smile. All sorts. Come on. She strode to the back of the room. Tom struggled to keep pace and stopped in front of a bank of wooden shelves filled with what appeared to be stuffed animals, until he saw one of them, a small round-headed owl, blink its bright yellow eyes. Whoa! That's... that's alive! Well, yeah, the young woman said. Who'd buy a dead muse? A large orange and yellow gecko with bulging dark eyes sat to one side of the owl. On the other side was a creature that looked like a kangaroo, though it couldn't have been larger than a gerbil. There were muses on every shelf, tiny griffins, two-headed lizards, winged horses that could stand in the palm of his hand, and butterflies whose bodies glowed like lightning bugs. A hummingbird darted around his head like a winged jewel, and a man, no more than eight inches tall, stood at the center of one shelf, staring back at him appraisingly and puffing on a pipe. Is that a gnome? Tom asked, bending over to look at him more closely. The little man scowled. That's Clybus, the woman said. He's a story hob. Oh, Tom smiled weakly at him. Sorry. Clybus didn't appear mollified. 
Any of these muses will help you, the woman said. Although at this point you might want to rule out Clybus. Tom walked to the far end of the shelves, where a tiny lizard lay in a tight ring, its head hidden beneath what appeared to be a membranous wing. Even in the dim light of the loft, the lizard's skin was lustrous, its colors constantly shifting like a sheen of oil on water. What about this one? Tom asked. The woman didn't answer immediately, and Tom looked over at her. Her cheeks had gone pale. Is this one for sale? That's a dragon muse, she said in a hushed voice. Tom smiled. A dragon? He stopped, staring at the creature once more. It had moved its wing and lifted its tiny head, which was, in fact, dragon-shaped. It gazed back at him with bright silver eyes, slitted like those of a python. After a moment, it yawned, exposing row upon row of minute, needle-like teeth. Then it stood and stretched, unfurling its wings like tiny sails and swishing its long, tapered tail. A small puff of gray smoke rose from its nostrils. I want this one, Tom said, the words coming out as a breathless whisper. It's very expensive. I don't care. It's... it's dangerous. Tom looked at her. Dangerous how? When it inspires... Kathy! Tom and the woman turned simultaneously. The store clerk from downstairs stood in the doorway, glaring at Kathy. How is it dangerous? Tom asked again, more forcefully this time, as he looked from one of them to the other. The dragon muse wields powerful magic, the blonde woman answered. And like all powerful magics, using it carries risks. Tom glanced back at the dragon, a frown on his face. It was tiny and beautiful. It looked more like a toy than a magical being. It certainly didn't look like it was capable of hurting him. Will it help me write? he asked, facing Kathy once more. Her gaze flicked toward her friend, but then she nodded. Yes, you'll write. Guaranteed? She nodded. And how much is it? Again, Kathy looked at the other woman. Sixteen hundred, the blonde woman told him. He gaped at her. Sixteen hundred dollars. As I said, Mr. Mathers, this is powerful magic. Tom eyed the other muses. These others are less. Yes. And they'll still help me write? The blonde woman hesitated, then nodded. Yes, they'll help you write. But not the way the dragon muse will, right? That's right. Are the others dangerous? The woman considered this briefly, her brow cresting. Using any muse carries some risk, but none is as dangerous as the dragon. Tom noticed that the story hob was leering at him. He thought that the little man might be a more perilous choice than the two women knew. I'll take it, he said, making his decision in that moment. Kathy didn't move. She stared at the other woman, her cheeks ashen. All right, the blonde woman said. She wiped her palms on her jeans and walked quickly back to the counter. Circling behind it, she rummaged through a drawer, her head down, her eyes narrowed. After several moments, she made a little sound and straightened, a yellowed index card in her hand. She returned to the back of the loft and held the card out to Tom. You'll have to read this to it. Tom frowned again. What? You'll have to read what's written on the card, out loud, to the dragon. Then it will be yours. She smiled faintly. After you've paid, of course. Tom looked at the card, typed onto it, and it did appear to have been typed, years ago on a typewriter, were these words. I take thee as my muse. I am bound to thee as thou art now to me. Thine spark shall be my inspiration. To whichever of us shall conclude before the other, so shall go the spoils. Sicut nos pacti sumus, hayet omina fiant. Some of this is in Latin, Tom said, eyeing the woman again. And what does this mean? This part about the spoils. Conclude what? The woman took a breath and drew herself up to her full height. You have to finish your book before the dragon grows to her full size. Or? Or she'll... she'll devour you. Tom opened his mouth, closed it again, eyed the dragon, then Kathy, 
and finally the blonde. She'll devour me. <laughs> he laughed, hoping the women would laugh too. They didn't. You mean she'll eat me? This is serious? Yes, the blonde said. So I'm her spoils. What are mine? The woman shrugged. If you finish before she's grown, you get a completed novel. Oh, right. Tom looked at the dragon again. She's tiny. She won't be able to... He shook his head. Yeah, all right. I can agree to that. He started to recite the words on the card, but the woman stopped him. After you pay, she said again. Shall I ring you up? Oh, yeah. He followed her back to the cash register, paid with a credit card, he wasn't looking forward to getting that bill, and returned to the mews. He began the oath again and got all the way through it, though he stumbled a bit over the Latin. When he finished, the blonde woman took back the card and returned to the counter. Kathy swallowed, still looking pale. You can take your dragon now? He eyed the little muse. How? At that, Kathy smiled. She stepped to the shelf and held out her hand. The dragon hopped to her palm, opening its wings slightly for balance. Kathy turned to Tom, who put out his hand. The dragon hopped again. As soon as the muse touched his hand, its tiny talons catching gently on his skin, Tom felt a shock, like static electricity, only more powerful. He cried out, jerking his hand back. The dragon fluttered up into the air and immediately tried to settle onto his palm again. Did it scratch you? Kathy asked. He shook his head, staring at the creature, unsure of whether he wanted to put his hand out a second time. No, it, it, it just felt funny. It still did. That first jolt of energy seemed to have traveled up his arm and through the rest of his body. Every part of him tingled. The dragon hovered before him and gave a small, plaintive squawk. <coughs> Reluctantly, Tom put out his hand again. And this time, when the dragon landed... Nothing happened, at least nothing unpleasant. The muse settled into the hollow of his palm, folded its wings, and looked up at him contentedly. After a moment, she lowered her head and closed her shining eyes. Tom glanced up at Kathy, a smile on his face. He opened his mouth to say something, but in that instant it came to him. He has to meet Becky in Chapter 3, he said. Kathy gave him a puzzled look. What? Speed. In my book, he meets Becky in the third chapter, and then they have to go out to the lake house in chapter four. From there, the thing practically writes itself. Kathy smiled. I guess the muse works. Tom nodded, as chapters six, seven, and eight unfolded in his mind. Yeah, I guess, he said. I've got to get home. Saying a goodbye to both women, he hurried down the stairs, out of word magic, and up the rain-drenched street to his apartment. Narrative threads and plot points swirled in his head, so that the walk home was little more than a blur. At the last moment, he remembered that his building didn't allow pets, and he tucked the dragon muse inside his coat before entering and flashing a smile at the doorman. He rode up the elevator with Mrs. Grady, who lived two floors above him, and who disliked him and his books because they were, in her words, prurient filth. She ignored him the whole way up, so Tom made a point of wishing her a good day as he left the elevator. He chuckled to himself as he walked down the hallway to his apartment, feeling in a better mood than he had in months. As soon as he was inside, he pulled the little dragon from within his coat and carried her into his office. After a moment's deliberation, he cleared a space for her on the bookshelf just beside his desk. He threw off his coat, dropping it on the floor despite the fact that it was soaked. Then he sat, and he began to write. It hadn't been like this since the early years of the Speed Falco books, when writing had been as easy as drawing breath. The words poured out of him, two thousand in an hour, forty-five hundred by the time night began to fall. He could have gone on through the dinner hour, but he was hungry. It occurred to him that he hadn't gone to Mocha Man after all. Getting up from his desk, he looked over at the dragon, who gazed back at him placidly, her scales shimmering in the dim light of the computer screen. He ate quickly, leftovers and a small bowl of ice cream, and then was back at it, hammering away at the keyboard. By the time he knocked off for the night, he'd written over six thousand words. He had finished chapter three and was already eight pages into chapter four. Sleep came slowly, though he was exhausted. 
His thoughts churned with ideas for the rest of the book, and for the next one, something to which he'd given no thought before now. Yet despite laying awake for so long, he awoke the next morning at seven, instantly alert and eager to get back to work. He brewed himself a cup of coffee, grabbed a bagel, which he didn't bother to toast, and walked to his office. He froze in the doorway. The dragon muse sat in the same spot where he'd left her, but she appeared to be twice as big as she'd been the night before, and in fact several of the books that had been on the shelf beside her now lay on the floor. Tom approached her cautiously. She sat up and flapped her wings, almost as if in greeting. Tom stopped just in front of her, and she stretched out her head toward him and closed her eyes, looking a bit like a dog asking to have its ears scratched. Reaching out slowly, Tom ran a finger gently over her neck. Despite their oily appearance, her scales felt dry and smooth, like snake skin. The dragon made a rumbling sound deep in her chest and stretched her neck further. Are you purring? he asked, stroking her some more. He laughed. <laughs> do dragons purr? After a few moments, he stopped. What do you eat? he asked. Are you hungry? She opened her eyes and cocked her head to the side, blinking those luminous silver eyes at him. Finally, she sunk back down into her usual sitting position and regarded him solemnly. Tom retreated to the kitchen, tore a few small pieces of turkey meat out of a package of cold cuts, and brought them to the muse, placing them on the shelf beside her. But though she sniffed at them, she didn't deign to eat them. Instead, she turned her attention back to Tom. He shrugged and sat down at his desk. In moments he was writing again, his pace even more remarkable than it had been the evening before. He completed chapter four before noon and was halfway through chapter five when at last he sat back, stretched, and realized that it was nearly three o'clock and that he was famished. He made himself a sandwich, quickly checked his email, his first time that day, which was truly astounding, and soon was back at work. At one point, he cast a quick look at the dragon and then did a double take. Could she possibly have grown more? Were there additional books scattered on the floor? He would have gotten up to take a closer look, but as quickly as the impulse to do so came to him, it was gone, replaced by a terrific idea for a twist in one of his key subplots. The next thing he knew, it was dark outside, and the only light in the room came from the glowing computer screen. He checked his word count, then checked it again. He had written just over 10,000 words today alone. At this rate, he'd finished the book with a day or two to spare. He stood, switched on the light, and gave a little yelp. Oh! The dragon was sitting up on the shelf, watching him, her tail curled around her front feet. She had grown. No doubt about it. She was the size of a cat now, a large cat, and she cleared half the books off her shelf. Tom stared at her for a long time, and the muse gazed back at him, her silver eyes so bright they seemed to glow. Even now, bigger and more formidable, she didn't look dangerous, though her talons were longer and a pair of curved fangs, one on the top row, one on the bottom, showed on each side of her mouth. I'm not sure you fit on that shelf anymore. Tom finally said. The muse blinked, peered over the edge of the shelf, and fluttered down to the floor, landing with a small puff of smoke from her snout. Tom saw that the scraps of turkey meat remained on the shelf, dried and curled now. Whatever was fueling her growth had nothing to do with food. He squatted down and stroked the dragon's neck again, smiling as the muse purred. Had it not been for explosive growth, and the fact that he was riding faster than he ever had— she would have been just like any other pet. Except easier, since she never ate or needed to be walked. Tom stood and started to leave the office, wondering if she'd follow. She didn't. She watched him for a moment longer before lying down again and closing her eyes. Good night, Muse, Tom said, and left. Once more his mind was filled with story ideas as he climbed into bed, but he managed to put those thoughts aside. Before long, he had slipped into a deep slumber that was marked by vivid dreams, including the most intensely erotic dream of Meg he'd had since their divorce. He woke early, feeling renewed and eager to write, but upon entering his office, all thoughts of the book fled his mind. Bloody hell, he whispered, staring down at the sleeping dragon. She opened one silver eye to look at him, but then closed it again. 
She had tripled her size overnight, and now reminded him of a Komodo dragon, one of those Indonesian lizards he'd read about that killed and ate people. Tom suddenly realized that he didn't know what full-grown meant for a dragon muse, or how long it would take his dragon to get there. He backed out of the office, dressed quickly, and hurried to word magic. The store hadn't opened yet when he arrived, but he could see Sue through the window, straightening up. He banged on the door until she finally came over and opened it. We're not open yet, Mr. Mathers. I know that. You have to tell me how big this dragon is going to get. She regarded him briefly, and then looked down the street in both directions. Seeing no one, she motioned him inside and bolted the door. Turning to look at him, she gave a small smile. She's growing quickly. She looks like a goddamn Great Dane. She even grew overnight when I wasn't writing. You had dreams, didn't you? Tom felt his color rising. What of it? The woman took a long breath. <sighs> she feeds on creativity even as she inspires it. That's why she gets bigger as you write. But she'll also feed on dreams, creative thoughts, stuff like that. If you stop to doodle, she'll grow. You need to focus on finishing your book. That he knew. How big will she get? He asked, dreading Sue's answer. How much time have I got? She'll get big. Bigger than you. Nearly too big to fit in whatever room she's in. Tom wasn't sure whether to be horrified by the idea of a full-grown dragon muse or relieved to hear how much more she had to grow before she could claim her spoils. He shuddered. Thank you, he said, turning to go. She opened the door again. I don't suppose... No returns, she said, pointing to a large sign behind the counter that said just that. Besides, you're bound by the oath. She's yours and you're hers. At least until your book is done. Or you become her lunch. He didn't need to hear her say it to know she was thinking it. Tom walked home quickly, shrugged off his coat, and went to his office. He paused in the doorway, eyeing the dragon. But she didn't stir, and after a moment, he sat down at his computer, booted it up, and got back to work. For the rest of that day, and over the next several days, Tom did little more than write. He ate dry cereal for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. He didn't bother to bathe or shave or brush his teeth. He slept fitfully, forcing himself awake whenever he realized that he was dreaming. And he tried to ignore the dragon muse, who continued to grow at a terrifying pace. She was the size of a deer and then of a horse, and by the end of the third day following his conversation with the woman at Word Magic, she was too big for such comparisons. She loomed over Tom as he wrote, making him feel like a mouse under the gaze of a hawk. But she never did anything threatening, and she often lowered her head so that he could scratch her neck or her chin, her eyes half-closed with contentment, her purrs rattling his desk and shelves and windows. As she grew, Tom made amazing progress on his book. A week before, he had despaired of ever finishing it. Now he was only a chapter or two away, which at his present pace translated to a matter of hours. The problem was, the dragon muse took up so much space in the office that Tom hardly had room to write, and he knew from his conversation with the store clerk what this meant. At one point, he happened to glance back at the dragon when she was in the middle of a yawn, and it was all he could do to keep himself from screaming and fleeing the apartment. Those tiny needle-like teeth had grown into dagger blades that gleamed like burnished steel. Shakily, he turned back to his keyboard and began what he decided in that moment would be his final chapter. The story wouldn't be quite complete at the end of it, but the muse didn't need to know that. He'd fix it in rewrites. Finishing was the only thing that mattered now. He wrote feverishly, casting anxious looks over his shoulder every few moments, was she closer? Was that her breath on the back of his neck, or simply the heat kicking on? She didn't seem to sleep as much as she had earlier in the week. Instead, she watched him, her brilliant serpentine eyes following his every movement. That couldn't be good. Tom forced himself to concentrate. He was close now. Five pages left. Three. And then the chapter was complete. He sat back in his chair and rubbed his eyes. The dragon didn't move. Tom stood and faced her, but she showed no interest in having her chin scratched. I'm done, he said, his voice sounding strained and unnaturally loud. 
I finished first. The dragon gazed back at him, and after a moment gave an achingly slow shake of her enormous head. No. He swallowed, reached for the phone and directory. He looked up the number for word magic, then dialed, messing up the first time but getting it right the second, and glancing repeatedly at the muse, certain that she was about to lunge for him. After three rings, someone picked up. Word magic, this is Sue. How can... This is Tom Mathers. Mr. Mathers, how nice to hear your voice. I'm done, but it's still... What's supposed to happen when I finish the book? When you're done with the book, the dragon muse will go back to the way she was when you began, when you spoke the oath to her. But I'm done, and... Are you really done? The muse can tell. All muses can tell. Tom stared at the dragon, holding the phone to his ear. Was she salivating? Yes, all right, he said, feeling ill. Thank you. He hung up. Fine, then he said to the dragon. Breathing hard, expecting to be eaten at any moment, Tom sat again and went back to work on the book. He cut the last several pages from the chapter he'd just completed and rewrote them, so that they led naturally into the real conclusion. It came easily, and for a short while he forgot all about the dragon muse. The sky outside his window darkened, his eyes burned with the strain of staring at his screen, but still he wrote, until at long last he reached what truly felt like the end of his novel. Again, he sat back, closing his eyes and taking a long, deep breath. Something touched his shoulder, and he practically leapt out of his chair, at the same time flinching away and swatting at whatever he'd felt. The dragon muse let out a little squawk and hovered before him, its tiny translucent wings beating furiously. Tom let out a high bark of laughter. Then he began to sob. I'm done, he breathed. He took the dragon muse back to word magic the following morning, concealing it within his coat as he made his way through the lobby of his building. Sue and Kathy were both downstairs when he entered the shop. Upon seeing him pull out the muse, Kathy smiled and clapped her hands. You did it! But Sue shook her head. I told you, Mr. Mathers, we don't give refunds. I don't want a refund, Tom said. I finished my book. That's what I paid for. But I don't want this thing around anymore. The oath was only for that book, right? Now that I'm done, and she looks like this again, we're no longer bound. That's true, Sue said. You'd need to give a new oath for a new book. But sixteen hundred dollars... Was money well spent. He gently lowered the dragon onto the counter rubbed its neck one last time, and turned to leave. Neither woman tried to stop him. But as Tom pulled open the door and stepped out into the street, he heard Sue say, That happens all the time. We make more money on this little girl. All right, welcome back, everybody. Thanks for listening to the story. I hope you enjoyed it. I know I did. Ooh. I think it's been a while since I've done that. As a matter of fact, it's been a while since I've done anything on this show. <laughs> True dat, as you also used to say. Oh, yeah. I said that all the time. Oh, man. I was so on fleek back then. Oof. That's awful, <laughs> man. You should be ashamed. <laughs> That's right. I have enough shame for both of us. Oh, good. Good. All right, so this story, how did this come into our possession? How did we wind up running this on the show? Is there a tale here? I don't think so. I don't I don't think there's anything interesting at all to talk about about the story. Um the recording you just heard was <laughs> made in 2012. Oh, that's and recent. <laughs> it was done for another podcast. And I just had it sitting edited on my hard drive for, you know, all these years. And the other podcast folded. They never used it. And so I, uh, I emailed uh, Mr. Co and said, you know, I have my own podcast. Can we please run it here? Then, as uh, I was listening to it and, and just 
bemoaning the sound quality of 12 years ago or 10 years. How long ago was 2012? It was seven years ago. Okay. Bemoaning the audio quality of seven years ago, I, I thought, well, maybe I could get somebody to do the female voices and maybe Big could contribute and it would be more like a Dune Steve, more like the recordings we did of, of old with the multiple voices and multiple hours of work to produce. And so, uh, yeah, we, I, I asked uh, Bria Burton, friend of the show, Bria Burton, oh. if she would do the voices of the, uh, the employees of the book shop. And uh, I got you to be the, the agent. And so there you go. It's almost like a new Dune Steve episode. Yeah, except for that it's very old. You know, my son, who just had his seventh birthday, was born in 2012. <laughs> He's in first grade. So, it's, uh, so like I said, no, not an interesting story behind, you know, the running of this uh, or, you know, why we're running it. But uh, I found that the story was interesting and I like it enough and I feel like it's up our alley enough that uh, it, it's right at home here on the Dune Steve. And the subject matter of this, the story is not unfamiliar to you and me. Yeah, it definitely isn't. Uh, in fact, I was just uh, mentioning this to you uh, the other day when we were talking about doing this episode. We've run a few muse slash, uh, I don't know, idea getting <laughs> stories for writers uh, in the past as well. Um, the ones that came to mind for me were the, I call them the idea... I don't call them anything. What am I saying? They both had idea in the title. You and I did. Uh, it wasn't really a broken mirror story because we just wrote them separately on our own. But I did a story called Battle of the Ideas and you did a story called House of Ideas, which was, they were both muse type stories. We did these way back in 2013, which was almost the same time as you read this story. Uh... But yeah, th those were uh, stories that we'd written that had to do with the writing process. I think in your story, someone found that a toilet stall was his muse. <laughs> and in my story, the ideas in the guy's head were trying to escape for greener pastures because this guy wasn't writing the ideas that he had. He was being too lazy to write. So basically, that story was about me. <laughs> and the funny thing, too, was a, a few years later, we did another story called Hope on the Rocks by Adam Gifford. And he had a story where a guy gets a muse. He gets a, a lucky rabbit's foot. And he sits down and writes something great. <laughs> you chuckle. Why you chuckle? Well, it's just, it's funny that... This is a recurring theme, and it's not just a recurring theme on our show. Why do you suppose writers write about this subject so much? I suppose it's something that we all know. It's something we all struggle with, you know, having good ideas, believing in yourself, putting in the work. You know, I think I've said it before on this podcast I I would love it for there to be, I don't know, a genie or just some great writer that just had a, a paucity of ideas that I could just go to him and say, well, how about this idea? Write this book. And then I tell him my idea and then he writes it for me so that I didn't have to put in the effort. It's hard work. You know, we've talked about that before, too. It's not digging ditches. So we're not out in the sun. We're not going to be sore from having done it, except for maybe your ears what? might be sore from sitting on the chair that you sit on while you write, but that's the uh, the worst it's gonna get. But still, it's 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 hard to do, you know. It's not something that that doesn't take any effort. Uh, I think a lot of people who don't write might think that that it's a simple, easy, low effort kind of a thing. But it definitely is not that. It, it's tough. It takes a lot of mental fortitude to make your way through writing. I think that's one of the main reasons why there's millions of 
unpublished writers out there and few that have actually, you know, made it there. It's like, I, th I think you said when you lived in LA, oh yeah, I, I met this guy and he told me, oh yeah, I'm a screenwriter. And you're like, oh really? How many scripts do you have? Do you have them out, you know, for people to check out? And they're like, oh, well, I've got this idea for this one that I'm going to write. And you're like, what? I've written six screenplays <laughs> or something along those lines. I'm, I'm paraphrasing your story. It could be making it up out of whole cloth for all I know. No, no, that's totally accurate. Although, you know, maybe he still lives there and owns his own home. And yet me, yeah. yeah from I... all those tips he got waiting at the uh, restaurant. <laughs> Work is work, don't you know? That's right. But, you know, I, I, I remember somebody, I, I can't remember who it was, said that the hardest two words for a writer to type are the and end. We, we talk about that, the, that everybody has ideas, and a lot of ideas are really, really good. Maybe everybody is born with a couple of ideas that would make for great stories or novels or movies, but... Finding the inner strength to write it, to get it all done, is, is such a huge challenge. And then, you know, you got to do revisions and you've got to fix this and that and there. And, and you know, what if you, the ending doesn't work? We always say that it's not dicking, dicking. Whoops. Explicit <laughs> warning, kids. It's not digging ditches. No. But it's a different kind of work uh I, I, right here's an, he, we can do this as an outtake but i told you that i had a friend who d d for their job they did the uh complaints and 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 problems and customer service on the telephone when people call up to say i this this i am angry i need to talk to somebody that was their job and i have dug ditches and i have done customer service and I would rather dig a ditch than be that person <laughs> who has to say, oh, I, I am very sorry that this happened to you, sir. Don't worry. We will take care. Please don't, don't yell, sir. I, how could you know my mother? Um, that stuff is exhausting emotionally or exhausting to the soul, whereas manual labor, doing construction is exhausting to the body. And yeah, your body heals itself, but your soul just dies a little further every time. I spent two months as a telemarketer when I first graduated college. And <laughs> it was funny because I started calling in sick and stuff like that. And I was I was just like, I've got to get a different job. I've got to get something else. <laughs> I started looking around and, and, you know, putting in applications and stuff. And my wife started wondering, oh, no, did I marry a deadbeat? This guy's just calling in sick to his job instead of going, oh, no. She didn't understand because she didn't have to do telemarketing, which is the worst thing in the world. So... Yeah. yeah. Have we talked about this before on the show? I think we could do an entire episode talking about our experiences with that, with telemarketing. And I, I remember it was our first day after training. Mm -hmm. And maybe it was even the first day of training. And they said, you know, a month from now, half of the people in this room will not be here. They understood that the job sucked that much that half of the people would rather look for another job or be unemployed than still doing what this was our first day to do. <laughs> and you've told me before that maybe not the worst thing in the world, but on your top three is looking for a job of <laughs> yeah. things that you hate more than anything. And yet people were just like, I don't, I don't care. I don't care. This sucks that much. And I think I stuck with that job for like two and a half months. And I'd look around and nobody that was in my training group was still there. Well, I guess I, this is not what we're here to talk about. But it's just it's what I want to talk about. Because there's such a thing as, as physical labor. And then there's such a thing as mental labor or emotional labor or, or spiritual labor or something to that effect. And writing can be... 
the, this arduous mental process where you just, ah, uh, and, and after three hours of writing, it is like working, you know, eight hours in a warehouse, loading boxes and all that stuff, where you get to the point where suddenly you can't lift your arms up above a certain point. And you're like, <laughs> oh my gosh, what happened? This box, it says it weighs 14 pounds. And I, what is wrong with, you know, that kind of thing? Maybe I'm just old and weak instead of weak, <laughs> but you know what I'm talking about. And, and I guess we talk about this all the time. And maybe it's an excuse. Maybe it's like, well, that's why I haven't written today is because it's work. And the person who's working three jobs and has a pounding headache and goes home and they say, well, I might be able to get four hours of sleep tonight is just saying, shut up. And and I guess, <laughs> yeah, I've taught myself that, okay, I need to stop and, uh, and, and write more because what's my excuse? Yeah, I mean, that's the, that's the hard thing, you know. It is work, and there are jobs that are mentally tough, and that takes it out of you, too. And there are jobs that are physically tough, and that takes it out of you, too. Nobody's going to say that a brain surgeon is not working hard as he spends 16 hours slicing and dicing somebody's hippocampus or whatever. You know, he's not digging a ditch, but nobody's going to say that he's not doing work and that he's not working hard. And writing is the same thing. Uh, you also get to cut into people's brains. Uh, <laughs> unfortunately, in that case, it's your own brain. You have to lobotomize yourself. Uh, <laughs> it's tough, but as uh, I think with anything in life, the things that are tough are the things that are worth it. You know what I mean? Like nobody cherishes the trophy that they got for the soccer team that they were on, but almost never saw the field, you know, and there's like, here's your participation trophy. And nobody like takes those and puts them up on their shelf and just like, oh, wow, I earned that by sitting on the bench. You know, that's not the thing that's special to you, you know, the thing that you just got because you were there uh, or whatever, you know, the things that where you had to work hard and you earned it through your labor, through your endeavors, you, you know, did your thing and it turned out well or whatever, then you're really proud of yourself and you know that you've done something special. So yeah, writing's hard, but I don't really want a genie to do it for me. <laughs> Truthfully, I don't even really want a genie to inspire me like in this story you know you have this magic dragon that inspires this guy with ideas and with uh oomph with get up and go with uh desire to get it done when he's done with that is he gonna really value that book i mean maybe it got him out of a jam that he was in because he wasn't putting his known nose to the grindstone and actually working hard. But most likely, he'll probably be back again at that store when his next deadline runs out and he realizes that, oh, crap, I didn't do what I should have again. And now i got to go buy another magic uh, muse, another little magic statue to come and force me into doing what I should have done on my own because I am a lazy piece of crap, you know, <laughs> and I am a lazy piece of crap. I know that, uh, and I would say that I'm not alone. I think there's a lot of us out there that are that way. People who think that there's, you know, that there's something out there for them, you know, you, you, you feel like you're not fulfilling your potential, and yet, at the same time, you're not doing something to fulfill that potential. I don't think I'm alone in that state. And I think there's probably differing uh, opinions on that. There probably are people who are just like, oh, yeah, just give me a magic dragon. I'll just write real fast and you know, hopefully it won't eat me because uh, then I'll get what I want. You know, it'd be like winning the lottery rather than working hard to earn 
your millions of dollars or whatever. You know, what, what tends to happen with people who worked hard to earn their millions of dollars? 20 years down the line, they, they have more money still. But people who win the lottery 20 years down the line, they, you know, they're broke, they're on drugs or dead, and everyone they've ever known hates them. So the magic bullet isn't necessarily the best way to go. I don't know. I know that I need to do better. I need to be that guy that actually puts in the work. I'm not there yet, unfortunately. I, I still try and avoid things. And uh, that frustrates me about myself. I wish that I wasn't that way. I wish that I would prioritize the things that were most important to me instead of wasting time with other little things that don't really matter in the long run. But... Uh, it's well, you need a dragon muse. <laughs> yeah, I need something that's going to eat me. Man, just, just like the guy in this book, in this story, I, he had it within him to write this book. He had written books before without a death threat hanging over him. Um, but something had atrophied inside him, or, or I, I, I mean, broken. I don't know. You and I have both had moments where it's just like, you know what, I don't I don't want to write. I don't care anymore. I just, I can't find it within myself to care. And I guess that had been going on with him for, I don't know, a George R. R. Martin level amount of time. And, <laughs> and, and what he needed was a, I don't know, a finger on a trigger pointed at him that says, if you don't do this, it's over. And sometimes I, I feel like that's what I need. You need somebody in your corner who's not a, just a cheerleader, but is a coach yelling at you to get up and do it. Executioner. I guess this this took it to the extreme. But there were <laughs> certainly moments in this story where I related and thought, that is what I need. I, I would like to go to that place and buy, maybe not buy the dragon one, but uh, they had many muses there. And, uh, I don't know, we, the last, I guess my goat that you and I did, we talked about glass and I don't know if you remember. Glass. Exactly. Who gives, Who gives a, a shit, shit about, about glass? glass? <laughs> yes. That, that episode is still available kids. But in the first unbreakable, Elijah is talking to, to David and, and he asks him about, you know, how he feels uh, why he does what he does for a living. And David tries to explain that he just, he wakes up every morning and he feels empty and sad. Like he's not doing what he's supposed to be doing, but he doesn't know what it is. And at the end of that movie, he says, today was the first day where I woke up and I didn't feel that sadness. I mean, now he knows what he was put there for. And, 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 and Elijah says, now that we know who you are, now I know who I am. And, you know, it's, it, it, it's this triumphant moment at the end of that movie. I, I really, really like Unbreakable, uh, even though I'm not a huge fan of, of Glass. Uh, but I just, <laughs> you were talking about that, of, you know, how many people don't do what they, it's not even what you want to do. It's, it, there is a, voice inside you that says you know you you could do better you aren't fulfilling your potential you aren't where you're supposed to be or who you're supposed to be and 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 if other people don't have that voice then that's great watch just a little more tv yeah sometimes i'm jealous of people like that <laughs> I wish I could be the guy who's just like, no, nah, I'm just going to, you know, binge on Netflix and I'll be happy with that. That's that's all I need. Nothing else. But unfortunately, anytime I watch a, even like a one hour TV show, I think, oh, I should be writing. I should be doing something more productive. The only way I can manage to watch something is if I know we're going to talk about it on the podcast. <laughs> so it's 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 homework. Well, yeah, because I do my homework. I don't know. I, I think that that's something that you and I have in common is that we feel like that, that being storytellers is what we're supposed to do. And I don't know why it's so hard to make us do that. 
when it feels good when you do it. And, and, and maybe that's like dieting. Maybe that's like exercise. Maybe that's like a third thing that feels good after you've done it, but it doesn't feel good while you're doing it. Gosh, and that, that's not even true because how many times are you writing and you just smile and you're just like, hey, this is working. I'm doing this. Wow. Although maybe exercise feels that way too. I, I can't imagine dieting ever you're like, hey this is working well being on a diet and you get on the scale and you weigh less and then you weigh less the next day and you weigh less the next day you get excited about that in that same way as you i don't know check your word count and go oh, wow look at all the words i wrote uh you get excited about that and you think hey and you smile you don't smile because everybody else is eating cake and you're just standing there going mm -hmm. you know there's still a little joy you can get from dieting similar to exercise and writing. Dieting. But yeah, all three of those things are things that I struggle with, actually. I mean, I found out that I'm a diabetic a couple of years ago, which means I need to not eat certain things because those things make blood sugar go up and make me get less and less healthy. Makes it much more likely I'll never write any of the things that I want to write because I'll be dead. But it's really hard, you know, similar to writing, you know, I, the, the thing that you always used to talk about, I'm trying to think of what the context of it was, maybe you were mad because they wanted to uh, edit your writing and you're like, I wrote this thing, I stayed up all this time and worked really hard on it while well, you were out partying and having sex and I didn't get to do any of that. Instead, I put in the work to write this story. How dare you want to change it? <laughs> that's my guess as to what the context was you know what i'm talking about you've said that a bunch it's, of times i i totally know what you're talking about but when you put it that way it makes me sound like a douchebag but you know what maybe i am <laughs> but i earned being a douchebag yeah. in that context yeah there were all these people that were just like oh okay let's cut this part and let's cut this part and it's like yeah let's cut the hours that i spent to get to this point <laughs> where it's so easy for you with your red pen let's see you write oh you can't Sorry. Yeah, no, I know. I, I understand how you feel. And yeah, it's it's hard to do. But yeah, but the, the thing is that you've got to do it. And the good thing is when you do it, you're actually put in the work. You can you can sit back and look at it. And it's not a participation trophy. You know, it's a it's a championship trophy you got for winning. They actually, I think when you do NaNoWriMo, you don't just do it and then finish it or whatever. You win. You win NaNoWriMo, which I've never actually done. <laughs> <laughs> no, I haven't either. But traditionally, you and I try to challenge each other at least once a year, right? To write every single day. Podcast will probably come out right about the time February's over. Maybe oh. we should challenge each other to march. <laughs> <laughs> it depends on how long it takes me to edit it. I... February is the short month. That's why we always use that month. <laughs> That's traditionally the uh, the best month for... Uh, I'll do this every day this month. But yeah, it was a few years ago where I did it in February. And then I managed to keep going. And even I think I even bumped it up. I went from like 500 words a day in February to 1,000 words a day in March. And continued with that in April, and I, I wrote an entire novel. I wrote the whole first novel for the Sunny and Gray, I don't know, trilogy, I think it's probably going to be. Sadly, I haven't written the second one because I stopped writing every day. When, when we moved to Texas, it became kind of a too much stuff going on, and I stopped writing every day. And it's, yeah, it's one of those things. It doesn't matter how much of a habit of writing you're in you, you stop for one day it's over you'll never write again <laughs> but yeah maybe we should do that for march and everybody can follow along with us as we uh confess on our blogs how many words we wrote that day well i don't know it's easy to say yes i'm going to do it and not do it and so I try not to it's like new year's resolutions i try not to make any <laughs> new year's resolutions because they're just so easy not to do. And maybe that's worse than making a resolution and breaking it is not making a resolution at all. But Yeah, it's like Homer Simpson taught us in The Simpsons. You know, you tried and you failed. So what lesson did you learn? 
Never try. <laughs> but I feel that we should. I don't know. Maybe, maybe we, we'll think about it. We'll, we'll announce later if we're actually going to do it. But yeah, it is definitely something that we need to get on. I even started writing a Christmas story for our Christmas episode this year. And then Christmas came and went and I still haven't finished it. Oh, you didn't finish it? Not yet, no. Well, you need to finish it in time for a Christmas episode. <laughs> yeah, I better get going. Funny thing is, I'll blink twice and it will be Christmas. So time flies when you're having fun and when you're old. <laughs> well, then let's end this episode and move on to time when you could be writing. Probably a good idea. I should be writing right now. So uh, thanks for listening, everybody, to this muse of an episode. You know, all my kids love that band muse. Have you ever listened to them? Sure. They're all right. They're not terrible, but they're not really my favorite. Uh, <laughs> so the Dragon Muse, that's Imagine Dragons and Muse playing in one concert. So yeah, uh, thanks uh, to our author of the Dragon Muse, David B. Coe, for allowing us to do this on our show. But now I think it's time for us to go. I know. What do you think? Yes or no? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thanks for listening, everybody. I'm Big Anklevich. And I, I was Rish Outfield. Right on. Right on. The Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine is published under a Creative Commons attribution, non-commercial, no derivatives license. This means that you can share the Dune Steve with anyone you'd like, but you can't sell or change the files. David B. Coe is the author of more than a f- more than a fifteen fantasy novels. <laughs> yeah, that's right. I pressed the button. You're listening to the Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine.